Welcome back to this afternoon set of Phi Sessions 2021 Deep Dive Panels. Our first of two is titled Emergent Commitments and Responsibilities of the Cultural Institution. I'd like to introduce this panel's incredible moderator, Kama Lamakarel. Kama is an award-winning Mauritian Canadian multidisciplinary artist, educator, writer, curator, and literary translator. Kama's work is grounded in the exploration of justice, love, healing, decoloniality, hybridity, cosmopolitanism, ancestral healing, and self and collective empowerment. They are the author of Zomfam, Metonymy Press, which was named a CBC Best Poetry Book, a Globe and Mail Best Debut, and was a finalist for the QWF Concordia University First Book Award and the Writers' Trust of Canada Dane Ogilvy Prize. World Literature Today called Zomfam, quote, a milestone in Mauritian literature, end quote. In 2021, Kama was awarded the Canada Council for the Arts Joseph Esch F. Stauffer Prize for Emerging and Mid-Career Artists in Visual Arts. We are delighted to have Kama moderate and animate this panel with our highly esteemed panelists, Callum Bowden, Haley Mellon, Monica O. Montgomery, and Carmen Papalia. And just to let everyone know that we have French translation as well as ASL and QSL interpretation for these afternoon sessions. And thanks for coming back and joining us. Take it away, Kama. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, generous intro. More than anything, I wish the intro just said, Kama is somebody who's really excited to get into those juicy conversations right now. Uh, greetings, everyone, and thank you for your presence for this discussion around emergent commitments and responsibilities of the cultural institution. Um, when I say this, when I say emergent commitments and responsibilities of the cultural institution, I think uh, what I really want to highlight in, in, in this conversation as we, we're about to start it is I'm particularly interested in the emergent. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, just give me a second. Let's see. Sorry about this. Zoom life, as usual. I was trying to be pretty with the earrings, but I think they were into um, adding some background noise. Um, so to go back to what I was saying, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in that discussion of the emergent and the emerging um, in terms of thinking about our commitments, uh, the structure, the agency, the practice of the cultural institution, specifically right now uh, at this particular time um, in, in, in history. I think 2020 has been a redefining year in so many ways, of course, because of the ongoing pandemic, uh, but also I think in ways that there has never been before, there was a, a global reckoning around the questions of racism, of accessibility, of equity. And in a way there was those conversations that we were having and institutions were having probably in more profound ways than ever before. Um, and, you know, and then there's the question of did, to which extent have those conversations have had an impact? Was it purely symbolic? Was this a quote unquote demonstration of wokeness? You know, all of this is up for debate, of course. But for now, I think what I, we collectively interested in doing is to delve into those emergent models that came out, emergent strategies, and also use this time to also think about the speculative, think about what is it that we're dreaming of uh, in terms of the relationship between the cultural institution and what that holds uh, in regards to inclusion, to accessibility and to equity. So how do we reimagine, do the exercise of reimagining our cultural institutions? How do we go beyond what is readily available to us in order to rebuild, to deconstruct, maybe even to destroy the institution, you know, to be able to create democratic and accessible, accessible spaces for arts and cultural production? And more than anything, what is the way forward? Uh, when, you know, a lot of times for me, just using the word, institution typically implies that we are working within racist, white supremacist, ableist, 
and misogynist legacies. So um, how do we go forward from there? In order to be able to explore those questions today, we have a most wonderful panel of cultural practitioners who have been thinking through those questions, and I would say practicing through those questions for a long time themselves and have found multiple ways or thinking for ways of integrating uh, accessibility, equity within their own institutional contexts and practices. So please join me in welcoming, first of all, Monica O. Montgomery, who's curator of social justice and special projects and programming with the Smithsonian Institution of Arts and Industries Building. As an arts administrator and independent curator, she uses her platforms to be in service to society, working at the intersection of equity, community and diversity in museums. We have Heli uh, Mellin, who's the founder of Art Into Acres, a not-for-profit that supports the art community in having permanent impacts on wide lens. This initiative conserves large-scale landscapes with a focus on climate and biodiversity, supporting the conservation of millions of acres of new protected terrestrial, terrestrial areas on behalf of artists and institutions. Carmen Papalia uh, is also here with us today. Carmen, who in 2021 co-founded the Open Access Foundation for Arts and Culture, a pandemic era cultural organization that aims to set a new cultural standard for accessibility by nurturing creative and justice-oriented accessibility practices. And Callum Bowden as well, is here with us today, who is the co-founder of Black Swan, Berlin-based collective of artists, technologists and researchers, pursuing horizontal and decentralized approaches to the traditional art world templates for art making. So for peer support, artist-led funding and community organizing, they place resources into the hands of the users rather than the gatekeepers of the arts. So, um, I'm not reading the full bios of all of our amazing panelists right now, but I encourage you to seek out their work, seek out their presence online, and also their full bios are available on the FI Sessions website. So if you're more interested, I encourage you to look into this. But for now, I really just want to delve into this conversation. So I'm going to start by asking each of you uh, an individual question, and then I'm going to open it up to like more general question between us, questions between us, and then uh, later on we'll open it up to, to um, audience questions as well, which you can write into the Q&A function on Zoom for in terms of your questions. Uh, so Monica, thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. So um, besides being an arts administrator and an independent curator, you have also championed the visibility and the viability of racialized artists in art institutions. Uh, so on the one hand, your work consists of, of the question in ways of representation in the sense of like you bring to the fore, you bring into the space, into the institutions, marginalized artists and bodies and voices that traditionally do not take up space in cultural institutions. And then on the other hand, you also do advocacy work within the institution itself. So my first question to you is, can you tell us more about this relationship between the two, on the one hand, working primarily with BIPOC artists, bringing them in, on the other hand, working in terms of advocacy within the institution itself to change its structure? Do you feel that those are two sides of the same coins? Do you feel like, what is the relationship between like those two approaches to doing this work? And what are the challenges and lessons you've learned in doing this? Thank you, Kama. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Okay. And hello to all of the fellow co-presenters and all of um, the audience, the interpreters, um, PHI, the whole team. Um, I did just want to give a brief land acknowledgement. I'm based in DC, Maryland um, in America, and we sit on the traditionally unceded homelands of the Anacostan and Natchitoches tribes, and we want to honor native languages and lands and persons. So I I'm a creative disruptor and I love it <laughs> and I love it. I'm really here to question, um, to complicate, to nuance narratives and to challenge institutions, stewards of institutions, as well as artists and patrons um, to find 
harmony and synergies and break apart systems that are broken. And so within the many hats that I wear, being a social justice curator at the Smithsonian, I'm also co-founder and strategic director of an organization called Museum Hue that champions the viability and visibility of BIPOC folks and making sure that our voices are heard and we're represented in space, in museums, arts, heritage, history, culture. I also do a lot of diversity, anti-racism, consulting. Um, and I'm a professor. I teach about museums and social justice. So trying to catch that next generation. Um, and before they get too fomented and hardened, you know, how can we radicalize and decolonize their thinking? I see it all as different facets of the spectrum of trying to make sure that equity is embedded in the beginning, that it's not the croutons on top of the salad, um, but rather the DNA and the ethos um, of what we are trying to do as individuals, as institutions, as collaboratives. And so being a cultural creative disruptor means that I'm working with the institution in, on the inside. I'm also coming to institutions from the outside to consult and advise and implement. I'm also catching those who are unaware of all of the political dynamics and fraught tensions within structures of arts, culture, and museums, and making them aware that these things are being discussed, and then working with students um, and others who are trying to gain entree. I think it's also about how to create both a structural and a cultural intervention. How can I be a catalyst? And others, right, who do this work because we are not alone, we're crowdsourcing the brilliance here, position ourselves to translate between entities and parties as well as problematize and complicate moving away from white normativity or the default, right, or white supremacy and banishing tokenism, right, having a certain amount of black or marginalized or indigenous or persons of color, but what does it look like to mainstream our ideas and our existence and embody that presence and show up to make moments into movements so that there is sustained change. So I love working in and with museums. I also like working outside of them. I like championing for artists and making sure they get fair treatment and a platform. And I also like pushing artists to kind of come out of their comfort zone and speak the needs of what they are hoping for to institutions, right? So things will never change unless we speak up. There's a quote that I like um, said by a legendary gender neutral activist, Pauli Murray, um, who was a lawyer and a clergy person. And they said, we can't start to heal until we tell the truth. And so truth telling is at the essence of creative disruption, at the essence of making sure that equity and fairness is the lens we work through. And truth telling is what I am about. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Monica, for just like such a rich uh, um, a response. I'm like, there's so many things that I just want to like jump into right now, uh, but I will wait for a moment until we hear from everyone. But um, I very much love the, 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 like the, the way you use creative disruptor, like it's just so so filled uh, and full of, of potential. We'll, we'll come back to quite a few things you said uh, during the session. Uh, my next question would be for Callum, actually. Um, so Callum, with uh, Black Swan, the collective that you co-founded, uh, you are actually working towards a horizontal, decentralized approach to art making. And this means that you go through mechanisms of peer support and artist-led funding and community organizing um, to then place resources in the, in the hands sorry, of, of the users rather than the gatekeepers of the arts. Um, and I'm very curious about this because I, I feel like structurally already, you're already presenting us with a model of like how you are doing things uh, differently. Um, can you tell us more about this work? Like how have you thought through, through such a structure um, you know, that gaze, uh, goes against like traditional ways in which institutions work and how have you enacted uh, this approach in the work? Yeah, so first off, hello everybody, I'm Callum and I'm one of four members of Black Swan, which is a collective I co-founded in 2018 with Penny Rafferty, Laura Lotti and Laith Benkeda. And Black Swan very much was a reaction to many of the topics that have been discussed already today. Um, and earlier there was a comment about um, artists 
potentially leading the way and brokering new new relationships and driving institutional change. And this is very much the position from which um, Black Swan is starting. And we are all cultural practitioners within Black Swan that have in different ways experienced difficulties of accessing institutional resources or participating within legacy institutions. And so um, the failures of cultural institutions in meeting the needs of artists were very present for us. And um, we're all based in Berlin where there's increasing gentrification and um, it's increasingly difficult for artists to ask, uh, to, to just access very basic um, levels of security and, and resources. And so um, we wanted to try and use a methodology of speculation that could somehow drive positive material outcomes. Um, so thinking more about infrastructural critique and how we can respond to our critique rather than just keep that within a discursive space. Um, the project also is very much inspired by blockchain and decentralized autonomous organizations, but more in the 2017 and 18 version of things than the current NFT mania that is sweeping what seems like the whole internet. Um, and blockchains were interesting to us for how they propose a means of reprogramming the way that value is um, distributed, circulated, held, um, how they propose ways of thinking about um, designing digital platforms where the users benefit from the value that is created within them, thinking about how artists could benefit from the value created by their artistic practices. Um, but similarly, being very aware of even in 2018 of the, the limits of a technology that foregrounds the most insane types of markets. And so our approach has always been blockchain thinking without the technology due to not only the hyper marketization of everything, but also just in terms of access, it's still a very nascent technology and it's hard to, to grapple with the interfaces or the different onboarding mechanisms that you need to begin engaging with these systems. So we wanted to use blockchain as inspiration, but not be held back by the limits of the technology in its current state. Um, and so Black Swan's goal ultimately has been to rethink the the institution in terms of a digital toolkit or thinking about how we could use digital tools to somehow engender interdependent art worlds based around situated knowledges where the value is redistributed to the people who are creating it. Um, we understood that this was like a very utopian and difficult project to like begin trying to pragmatically address. And so we didn't want to take the usual tech industry methodology of imposing a solution to problems that maybe don't exist, but rather wanted to find ways of working with existing communities of interdisciplinary creative practitioners to think about what are emergent behaviors that aren't currently supported by institutional structures. What can we learn about the emotional affordances of different aspects of um, whether it's organizational forms or um, decision-making systems. And so we wanted to take a play-based approach to find out what an artist-led digital institution might look like. Um, over the last year, we ran a series of three different working groups, often with a role-playing element to somehow allow people to um, leave the here and now and, and take on different, different roles or different um, characteristics um, so they're not necessarily like beholden to their everyday experience and um, in this year we broke down our initial research around digital in instituting into kind of three parts first there's decision making so kind of asking how could we increase participation within the decision making around the distribution of cultural resources um, we did a working group over six weeks in Berlin at Trust, which is another collective that I'm part of. Um, and we tested three different voting, voting mechanisms, one being more technological called quadratic voting, which is a multi-voting system um, against more familiar types of decision-making like one person, one vote and a lottery. 
And from this, we found that actually this more complicated multi-voting system was preferred for how it allowed participants to express granular opinions and like share their belief in a multiplicity of proposals and artworks. Um, and so from this, we developed a prototype quadratic voting web app um, called Signet, which um, is based on the asynchronous messaging platform Discord. Um, there's a lot in this project. We then at Cave in Berlin also worked with 40 artists over the summer doing a, a role-played hackathon around organizational structures and modes of exchange. And then finally um, in November or October at the Von Abbey Museum, we looked at um, ontologies of value and how value emerges through creative practice and isn't just embedded within the object form, but is very much based within entangled social relationships and thinking about how could a digital tool be based around these alternative ontologies of value and not just um, narrow and reductive market values. That is that is my my blurb for now. <laughs> Excited for the conversation later. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just writing down some notes. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like I just like in many ways, like just almost like stepped into the future. And I love how you frame this as being utopian because I'm like, oh, okay, you really, you're thinking outside of the even like the materiality of things. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll delve more into this. Uh, uh, let me uh, ask my next que question to Carmen, actually. Um, and then I go to Haley, and then that's I'm going to allow us to, to set the ground. So, um, so Carmen, you your work over many many years has actually aimed at challenging art artistic institutions uh, to set up new standards and practices, specifically when it comes to accessibility. And you frame this work in many ways as cultural institutions um, having a responsibility, right? Like it's a responsibility, or at the very least, having the possibility. Uh, and the space to, to, to create a space of care and of capacity building uh, for disabled, sick, and, and cr chronically ill people. Um, then in doing so, uh, the cultural space becomes a possibility model, right? Like which can be well, upheld in those other spheres where we need to think through the questions of accessibility. Um, can you tell us more about your work in particular? I'm, I'm kind of interested in hearing your success stories, quote unquote, in terms of pushing those models within these, these institutions. Like what are the ways in which you've maybe succeeded and or, you know, what other kinds of challenges you face from the institution in doing this? So um, thank you so much. And um, uh, for, for others, um, I'm, I'm calling in from the stolen lines of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people um, in what is known as the Hastings, Hastings Sunrise neighborhood. So um, I, yeah, so I'm, I'm a disabled artist um, and uh, advocate. Uh, I just co-founded this organization in uh, February that kind of builds on my work over the last uh, maybe 10 or more years. Um, the topic that I usually address is accessibility. Um, and I've done that in various ways in my own practice, uh, starting with, uh, you know, uh, I guess challenging the institutional symbol of the uh, white cane. So I, I use a detection cane uh, to find my way around. And uh, I describe myself as a non visual artist. Um, I don't use words like blind or visually impaired to describe myself because I Feel like those um, terms privilege visual experience. So ever since I started using a cane, um, I started modifying it because I was not in alignment with the um, institution that it's associated with. So um, one of my performances um, series, I replaced my cane with different things that I use to navigate public space, one being a marching band that uh, serves as my navigation system. Um, so that's kind of where I started um, in addressing accessibility and kind of like my own access. Um, and then I kind of applied that idea to art institutions um, and just started to think about the colonial and ableist roots of the, um, of the art institution, but how like important access to a cultural 
platform is, especially for underrepresented groups. And so um, people with disabilities actually account for the um, largest equity seeking group, um, but they have the least access and representation within the cultural sector of any other group. Um, and this has to do with limited access to employment, um, uh, limited, um, mo I mean, the most common experience within the disability uh, community is, is that of being on, on in poverty. So um, we really, as a community, are uh, still, I think, um, trying to, I think, coming to this point, uh, Culturally, um, and I think this was very much spurred by the disability justice movement, which uh, um, emerged in 2005, where we are really developing our own systems and practices and resources um, for care and building capacity for care within our communities that we lack um, on account of, you know, governmental failure and um, ableism and uh, policing. So it's very much the disability justice movement is a... Uh, I think very much connected to transformative justice. Um, it, it imagines a world that doesn't require institutions um, or the state. Um, it was it was proposed. This framework, disability justice, um, was proposed by um, a collective of uh, queer women of color um, who are disabled, and it prioritizes people who are the most impacted by the various uh, forms of oppression. So. Um, I'd encourage people to look up the principles of disability justice. I think it's really a great roadmap for how to proceed um, in, in establishing the supports that we need to uh, live uh, full uh, lives in community with each other. Um, and, um, and so I think when it, it comes to addressing accessibility in the institution, like uh, in the cultural institution, um, it really is about um, can can the institution host us so we can be our full selves? Um, you know, can people be considered and not just be kind of compartmentalizing access, aspects of their identity? Like, you know, disability justice is, you know, embraces uh, all intersections of experience, recognizing that, you know, we are disabled and um, racialized, disabled and queer. Um, and so um, really is a, you know, this, this um, framework that allows for cross movement solidarity. So I think um, with what we are trying to achieve uh, with disability justice and those are who are dedicated to it um, is a, a world, an ecosystem that can hold us um, and carry us in our wholeness where we, in a place where we have agency and decision-making power um, and representation and decision-making processes. Um, and, uh, we, I, I think, um, have adopted um, a system for accessibility as disabled people that was invented for us, especially within the museum and the arts. Um, access, access programs grew out of education programs. The first accessible programs, like um, an example would be um, in 1913, there was a series of uh, talks for uh, blind ch school children at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And really, this was just a way of delivering, you know, uh, art, art, historical information, um, and reinforcing the privileged visual art experience. It wasn't about, you know, translating in a way that would be accessible to this group. And um, and and I think it, access programs have pretty much stayed within that group. Um, they, you know, often is the case where, you know, if myself, I will be offered an opportunity to touch something, maybe a texture sample. Um, and the idea is that I will touch something to get a sense of what the thing that it came from looks like, um, not how it necessarily feels. Like we don't have a conversation about tactility um, and, and what, you know, um, and, and that dimension of access. So I think with the disability justice um, movement and the ways that it is, is finding its way in guiding uh, work within cultural institutions, um, it, it really is about um, allowing um, this kind of uh, existence from a dis disabled uh, or, or dis for the point of view of disability culture. Um, so, you know, can these cultural cultural institutions actually meaningfully carry disability culture um, in all its complexity. And um, 
I think we do much in our culture to minimize disability or to alleviate the condition of disability. We want to, as, uh, as, as Eliza Chandler, uh, who's a disabled uh, scholar and, and curator, says, dwell with disability. So we want to be able to, um, you know, imagine a world that centers disability experience. Um, so as myself, as a non-visual work, uh, as a non-visual artist, can engage with, uh, you know, uh, in non-visual learning, um, or someone with a chronic illness um, that is episodic, does it have to be held to the uh, maybe kind of brutal timelines of the uh, uh, of the art institution? So, uh, you know, I really think it it requires a radical restructuring and reshaping of the institution around the the, the demands and desires of the disabled body and mind. Um, that is. You know, I, I would I would think of like what needs to be prioritized uh, within the institution to center um, that that caring culture. Um, you know, would we is, is it relevant for us to hold on to our our collections when we don't even have you know accessibility measures, the basics um, available for people? Um, you know, could we potentially um, use those um, and re reallocate those resources for? For folks um, in various ways, and so um, I think I think really what I'm, I, I what I mean when I say I want it's, uh, our organization as well it sets a new cultural standard for accessibility. Um, I think I, I really want to think about what what can accessibility beyond an accommodation be or beyond compliance be, um, because usually an institution understands its responsibility to the disability community through compliance with law. So, or policy that, you know, if it's not followed, there'd be repercussions. But the truth is there, the non-compliance is so widespread and a lot of institutions don't even understand their responsibility, the basics, which are for many, like the bare minimum for participation, Re you know, requirements that allow someone to get in into the building and, you know, kind of navigate their surroundings, um, but how are they treated once they're there? So I, I really, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've had many <laughs> interact, interactions with institutions around the world. Um, I'd say my my most success, uh, what, you know, recently has been with the McKenzie Art Gallery in Treaty 4 territory, uh, uh, so-called Regina, um, Saskatchewan. Um, I've been working with them, with them for a few years, um, and we we recently uh, developed a new accessibility uh, policy together um, that involved community stakeholders and advisors from various communities, uh, friends. Um, you know, uh, my my friend David Garneau, who uh, is a Métis painter and curator. Um, uh, Peter Morin, who uh, thinks about indigenizing uh, museums, uh, local elders, representatives from disability justice organizations. And really it was this years long learning for the institution to shift the paradigm from uh, universal design or like universal accessibility at these like basic bare minimum compliance level measures to um, a world that centers disability uh, culture culture and experience and, and how that serves um, uh, other missions around decolonizing, for example, and holding an anti-racist space. So um, I, I'll leave it there, but thank you for the time and um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you so much uh, for being with us and, and for such a generous response. I'm, I'm going to quote you again. One of the things that you said that I wrote down is like, you know, thinking about an ecosystem that can hold us in our wholeness, you know, like that really stayed with me. And we're going to come back to it uh, in a moment, because uh, that's something I think that's going to be my next question for all of you around this. But uh, let me welcome Haley. Uh, so Haley, you founded the Art for Acres, an artist founded nonprofit environmental and art initiative based uh, in California. Uh, focusing on large-scale land conservation for climate, indigenous peoples, and biodiversity support. Um, I find the notion of uh, land conservation, like it's something that really struck me uh, because in French, interestingly, uh, we have two words for curator in French. Uh, one of the word is commissaire, as in like curator of an exhibit. 
Uh, and then the other word is conservateur or conservatrice, so conservator, which is like the curator, the conservator, the curator in a museum who basically conserves the work of art. Um, and with art uh, into acres, I find the notion of conservator and conservation comes back, uh, but not in relationship to artworks, but in relationship to ecologies, to territories and traditional lands of indigenous peoples. Um, so can you tell us more a little bit about this model and the how and the why um, of how this model of conservation in a different way speaks to you in that relationship between territories and, and the arts. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Kama. I'm just happy to be here, as Carmen also said, and it's wonderful to listen to Monica and Carmen and Caleb talk about their work. Um, it's just such a pleasure. So I think, you know, today I am zooming in from the traditional homelands of the Miamiya and Shawnee people and what is known or called Miami Beach at present. And this acknowledgement is to think about the indigenous grounds that I'm located on today, but also to think about our capacity um, for understanding both longevity, but also a longer view in terms of how we exist with one another and how we exist within the landscapes that we live. Uh, your question about uh, conservation or being a conservator makes me think of the saying about, uh, you know, if you're going to plan for 100 years, you educate children. And my work works is very close between education and sort of climate justice and environmental justice. Um, I'm an artist. And as an artist, I'm interested in, in legacy and what we leave behind or what we push forward uh, for when we're no longer here. And also as an artist, I've learned so much from, from individuals and from cultures that um, are, are quite historical. So I'm co-founder of Art, Art to Acres, as you mentioned, and also of Art and Climate Action in San Francisco, of Artists Commit in New York, and the Environmental Council at MOCA in Los Angeles, um, which is the first sustainability council of a museum in the United States. And I think one of these intentions in, on my end is to engage, is to sort of learn, talk, and to support capacity building within the museum and institutional art space, within artists in their own studios, but also within just our communities. Um, because climate is something that we all share. It's really the term for long-term weather. And it's this um, engagement with also what we can't see, which is so fascinating from an arts, or artist or arts position. Uh, so, uh, I founded Art for Acres as an opportunity to support Indigenous-led uh, conservation efforts uh, on behalf of artists. And so for a long time, I worked with artists and we would, uh, you know, they donate a painting or sculpture or whatnot, and we would um, support the conservation, permanent conservation of a new conserved area somewhere globally. Um, and then an artist, Mika Rottenberg, came forward in 2019 and she said, you know, I, I don't really make that kind of art. Um, but I do do institutional shows and I'd really love to engage the institutions that I work with uh, in, in looking at climate justice and also looking at carbon drawdown, right? Because all the things that we do are creating a carbon emissions. This Zoom call is creating carbon emissions. And how do we clean up, you know, uh, sort of our pollution? And so we started putting a line item in her budgets. I think the first one was for the MCA Chicago and really just sort of adding in um, support for natural protection, support for avoided for deforestation of old growth forests. And from there, um, different institutions started coming forward. And to date, I think I've supported about 45 different museums in doing their first carbon audits for an exhibition. And, and from that, I just started seeing how exciting it was for artists to learn about um, the sustainability of their own practices. And artists commit recently, just a month ago, published something that is uh, an open template for all artists to use called a climate impact report. And it details not only your carbon emissions, but also how are you handling waste? How are you thinking about reusing packaging? Uh, what is the hiring and climate policies of an organization you're working with or showing in? And so all of that um, really sort of ties in this important uh, point of access access to education, to awareness, to facilities or to procedures that can make our daily practices uh, more sustainable and more viable for us all to continue to be here long term. Um, and I think that that underscores a deep sense of empathy 
um, not only for environmental justice and those impacted most by what will be coming climate change, but also for indigenous justice and for justice for non-human species. And so I think my work really engages that sort of like, how do we think about the non-human world um, and how are we sensitive to our impacts on the non-human world? Uh, at present, if you weighed all of the uh, animals sort of created for animal agriculture for human consumption, and then you weighed all, you weighed all the humans, so you weighed all of those mammals, there that would be 96% of the total mammal weight on the planet, and wild animals would account for 4%. So that's quite intense. Um, but I think that seeing this this work in action is quite exciting. This morning I was at at uh, ICA Miami meeting with them in Art Forum magazine and, and their staffs, Teresa and Kate and Alex were really excited talking about, you know, how can they think in a more sustainable manner? How can we slow down shipments? How can we um, plan in a way where we can uh, engage with our daily activities as such as to promote um, climate awareness and, and, and just get better practices across the board. And so to return to your question about conservation and curation, I feel like the, the curation of our daily activities and how we um, process our activities, what we choose to eat, what we choose to throw away, what we choose to use is going to really curate the conservation of our works in general. Because if we're going to make a sustainable platform, a sustainable cultural platform, that's going to enable us to promote and to, to promote the continuation of ourselves, both as a species, but also to promote the continuation of a way of living and being with one another that is inclusive to the accessibility of um, sharing practices that will allow us to sustain ourselves long term, sustain our culture long term and to sustain this, you know, wonderful art space that we engage. Um, and so that the works long term are continued to be experienced by people. So I think that's that's really my work. Um, we mostly support land conservation. We, and uh, we support maybe four or five, six new national national parks a year. Um, but it, it's quite a pleasure to do. And, and so yeah, those are some thoughts to begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, each of you. I'm like already like buzzing <laughs> with just so, so much right now. I think you've, you've all just shared ideas, strategies, but also things that you have tried or that you're dreaming of that you've put in place. And, and in the spirit of that, you know, like Haley, you talk about like longevity, right? Like thinking through the longer view. And Monica, you were talking about like, how do we turn mo moments into movements, right? Like, and, and in those multiple ways and, and Callum, you're talking about like the, the ontology of value and, and shifting that. And, and we're getting into all those questions, right? Like, and, and I really want us to now um, think in the long term, like, and in many ways, even like probably think in terms of like, uh, you know, like I really would want us one of the delve into the speculative, you know, like I, I think a lot of the one of the most inspiring work uh, is by Walida Imarisha and, and Adrian Mary Brown, who co-edited Octavia's Brood, which is a wonderful collection of short stories. Uh, where the premise of it is that it's basically a collection of short stories written by activists and movement builders, because the, the very premise of it is that activists and movement builders are dreaming of a different world, of dreaming of a world in which we exist and relate differently. So in that sense, we're quote unquote, already doing science fiction. And I want to push that question to the four of you as well, like in terms of like thinking, thinking into in into the long term, right? Like thinking into the future. I, I somehow go back to, you know, like what Carmen said earlier as well, that ecosystem that can hold us in our wholeness, which I find just find so powerful. What, uh, you know, like what is the dream in other ways or what is the ideal that we, we, we want to build ours, whether, you know, and I think, and, and I think each of you bring interesting uh, and necessary intersecting uh, con um, 
points of views, like in terms of thinking about the relationship to the land, thinking about the relationship to access, thinking, you know, like thinking about the question of race, thinking about the question of equity. So if you if you push that forward for you, like really like what is in, in even if it's speculative, but like I'm I'm tempted to frame it this way, like what is the dream? Where where do we want to get? Uh, what is this ideal? I don't know if in this ideal a cultural institution exists or not, but what is this ideal that for you that that matters to you where that that you want to see uh, in in the world? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ping it over to Caleb because I think he's he's dying to answer. <laughs> It's really the big question. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure if this will like translate, but I can try and unpack it. But something that in Black Swan we've been quite interested in, and I think also responding to this notion of like the ecological view and um, a holistic view, um, it's we're trying not to see institutions as like nodes or as the the thing that is in focus but rather as like the edges of the network or the thing that enables or facilitates the substance to exist and um, have access to resources um so like this is an anti-universal and ecological idea about what an institution could be based around situated knowledges practices alternative ontologies of value. Um, so we go from maybe a, like a modernist and contemporary art position of universalizing culture to thinking about cultures and the situated knowledges and um, different ways of being that are part of the world and aren't currently supported by infrastructures more generally. Um, and so like thinking about the role of these institutions or these proto institutions, I think it's, it's both about maintenance and about care, which is something that I think everyone has echoed. Um, in our work with Black Swan, we found that interestingly, artists aren't so interested in the, the maintenance work um, required to maybe hold a collective decision-making process, or it's it takes a lot of work on our side to get participation. Um, and this is in contrast to the way that technological systems, and especially within blockchain, um, technologies are thought about as being autonomous or as not needing constant social negotiation to exist. Um, and so I think like, yeah, this role of, of maintenance and making sure if something gets broken, there's someone to, to pick up the pieces um, is like a big important uh, thing. And I'll let all these other incredible people speak now. <laughs> Thank you, Callum. Monica, do you want to Can go? Can I jump in? Yes, Thank you. Please. Thanks for warming it up, Callum. We, <laughs> we got to come from every angle, right? We have to chip away at them. Um, all of the isms and issues in the patriarchies and every other thing and every other term um, from all the, the brilliance that we bring. And so I feel that, I'm sorry, <laughs> I had my heater on, it's cold here. I feel like the, the institution of the future is what we are building and what doesn't even exist yet. And speaking of care and this way of envisioning how institutions can radiate care, I've been trying to canonize and, and expand a definition of community care in the space of you know, museums, arts, and culture. Community care is a concept that I did not invent, um, and I'm kind of retooling it to work with clients um, who are trying to be better neighbors with their institutions. And so the way that I define community care in this context is an architecture of practice to honor our humanity that centers advocacy and empathy and social responsibility. So community care embraces our visitors, our community and ourselves, right? What would it look like if institutions ran that way? How transformative could that be to our societies? I, I believe that museums and other spaces for history, heritage, art, culture, science are that third space that we can all go 
and be in, whether that is digitally or physically, and experience wonder and joy and respite and, and have a space that we don't have to just consume and be capitalist. You don't, I mean, there are museum stores, right? But you don't have to buy anything in a museum or you shouldn't have to. Where can we go to just be and ponder, right? And come together and collaborate and spark off ideas. And those are the sorts of spaces that I like to work in and or create. And I think that is the institution of the future, a place that people can be held in the fullness of themselves, right? Thinking of culturally sensitive and trauma informed. I am a black American woman and I cry every time another black person from throughout the diaspora is killed unjustly at the hands of violence through state sanctioned violence and policing, through intercommunity violence, through vigilantes. I cry, I still am not numb to it, right? When I saw the when, when, when I saw the court cases, right, of, of George Floyd's killers and Ahmaud Arbery's killers and names that we've come to know, it, it, it hurts me, right? And even when justice is perceivably gotten, that life has been extinguished and lost. Can I show up to your institution in tears? Can I show up to your institution just totally bereft and, 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 and grief ridden? Would you welcome me then? Would you welcome me when I'm not at my prettiest and my best and smiling? Would you welcome me if I'm in a state of disarray? How can an institution literally hug me and those like me and make me feel better than when I walked in the door? What does that look like? How can an institution be a space of shared authority? It's not just the director and the executives and then falling down this line, this organogram, this kind of chart of power, right? What does it look like to share power and exchange roles and shadow one another and give up power and hand over power and cede your seat to those who want to come in, right? Or those in the community who should also have a vestedness and, and an understanding. What does it look like to factor in indigenous futurity, right? And thinking about indigenous persons and those who have created systems and structures and who think in generations and we can kind of go from this fiscal year to this generational kind of thinking. I, I feel like there's so much that an institution could be and do just to be socially responsive and anti-racist and free from that psychological violence, those microaggressions, those white supremacist ways. You know, I, I know in institutions, I'll just say that I have worked in and, and, and those that I've observed, it's, it's always about like, get it done fast, fast. It was due yesterday, right? What does that feel like to give people time and space to ideate and process and feel and bring their best and do their best when there isn't a crunch time, you know? So there's so much that needs to be decolonized and unpacked, but ultimately I feel like the institution of the future is the ones that will build and the ones will inherit and start from within us. Because an institution is just a collective of people stewarding a space. And so how can we be better stewards, better neighbors and better humans? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Oh, I'm letting this sink in right now. <laughs> like uh, really, um, Common, did you wanna share? Um... Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, I really want to build on, on what's already been said. It's, it's been really good. Um, yeah, so when I think about the future of maybe the cultural institution, I, th I think a play, a, of a place that is um, maybe, yeah, so I, I think about us breaking the conventions of our, our field um, that, that do lead to things like burnout or, um, you know, like these, these brutal timelines where you're, you're planning for, you know, a year out for an exhibition and it's so tight. So we can't really take time to rest and reflect and, and, you know, get public input. Um, I, I think this is so important for, you know, the true inclusion of, of disabled people um, because we run on different time signatures. Um, that are currently not supported. I mean, we we really have adopted a corporate and uh, uh, kind of model, uh, you know, industrial industrialized model for time um, that doesn't really work for anybody um, within um, the field. Um, very few can can kind of make it work. Um, so I think about what we do in disability-led spaces and this current conversation that has kind of been uh, uh, cropping up about crip world building. So 
um, you know, uh, imagining a world, a future from a uh, politicized disability kind of uh, point of view. Um, a crip is a politicized disabled person. Some people embrace that term. But they describe themselves as, as a crip. Um, um, so I, I think, you know, and this also goes back to, to this Eliza Chandler's work too, um, this idea of cripping the museum, cripping the arts. Um, this is a disruption. People with disabilities are already a disruption, but we want to be that disruption that can uh, promote a lasting change for our, our, our you know, complete inclusion. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think about, um, yeah, I, I don't exactly, I, I feel like, I feel like disability culture is a big idea. And, and I, I want for, you know, for, for not, not so far into the future, but like for people to soon, uh, understand disability as a culture, um, that we do have a history and, um, of activism, at, of um, you know the ways that we've been resilient, um, and that that currently is not understood or known. There are activist histories, um, activism that happens right now around harm reduction, for example. I'm really glad you brought Octavius Brood up, actually, uh, Kama, because it was launched at this gallery in Vancouver, uh, in, in the downtown east side, named Gallery Gachet. Um, and that's a gallery I've worked with um, uh, since 2011, and it, it's, um, it serves uh, and is run by, it's a collectively run gallery that is um, dedicated to demystifying issues relating to mental health. Um, so it's run by um, residents um, and, and artists who all come to that space um, to work through their experience and uh, while centering art practice whether they have experiences of trauma or you know, psychiatric trauma um, or have been institutionalized or um, you know, old traumas from um, uh, forms of colonized, colonization. Um, and so Octavius Brood was, was actually uh, uh, released um, at an event called Reverb, a queer reading series. Um, and uh, I would really, it's not running right now, this reading series, but I think they really did accessibility like they, they really were projecting into the future, uh, I think, uh, in the ways that they operated as, as a group um, with no money at all, um, were able to create this beautiful, um, complete kind of um, uh, uh, system of access um, and care um, for their events. So, um, and I, I guess like one, those visions into the future, when we, when we, when I participate in a disability-led space, I feel like I, 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 am, I have a portal into um, crip time, um, you know, uh, crip aesthetics. Um, I want that to be shared. I want that to, for our institutions, be able to hold that and to, to actually uh, understand disability as a culture um, and with its richness. So, um, I, yeah, that, that's... <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, also, just as a reminder, if people have questions, we can take them in a bit. You can drop the questions in the Q&A. Uh, Haley. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to underscore how important what Carmen said is and that it should be heard and acted on and acted on efficiently. And I really liked hearing uh, Monica's quote about uh, that institutions are just a collective of people stewarding a space. And I, I felt like when she said that, and I think you also kind of like wrote it down, but it opened up this sort of moment of like, okay, it's a space and, and space can be so powerful, but it also can be really uh, un, not powerful if we don't use it in an effective way. So if it is a space and it's a space that sort of is demarcated, um, we have to ask ourselves, what are we furthering in that space? What are we protecting? What are we maybe uh, underscoring that's helpful or not helpful as we start to unfold um, the language that is the future of our culture? And I feel like um, there's, if I move forward in her sentence, which is the word people, that's sort of where I would begin in answering your question because it, it is with people that we engage this this project right this sort of art making art looking it's a human maintained 
space. It's like, a, you know, we make like these squares or we make different things and we put them on the wall and it's a human presented space. It means nothing to a non-human animal. Um, and so if it is a human maintained space, we should look immediately at the people who work in that space. What is the situation of arts workers? And as new dialogues and new needs unfold, such as shifts in sustainability, we want to make sure that our arts workers are not, you know, beyond capacity, also underscoring Carmen's point, so that um, there is enough space to, um, <clears throat> to learn, to change, to stretch, to be pliable, to grow. And so really starting with our arts workers and, and transparency in, in worker pay, transparency in worker treatment, uh, hiring practices, et cetera, is really important. And then on the other end, in terms of cultural producers, like looking at artists. And I think from, as an artist, I feel like there's a, been a very inherited hierarchy as to how to access um, the ability to show in institutions. And there's a lot of shifts currently with digital work and with crypto work, et cetera, and looking at um, does that hierarchy need to be followed? But are there ways to just access the ability to exhibit in institutions um, in a way that's much more democratic and much more inclusive? And so I think that my interest is really just the people, the, the, the people working and building institutions and the people exhibiting in, in institutions because the health in that space is really going to be reflected in the vibrancy of the institution but also in the institution's ability to reflect the now and also the now's vision on sort of the the view of our historicity as a society as larger global culture um so yeah those are my thoughts thank you Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I hear a, a lot of things. Um, also, just yeah, as a note, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it out. So if people want to put in their questions, like now is a good time to do that in the Q and A box. Um, you know, like so we're talking, we're talking about like systems, the systems, the institution as a system, as a box, as a whatever symbol we want to give it to it. That's already in place. And then we're talking about people, right? Like ultimately it's people and within the notion of understanding people, there's our own personal values. And then there's also just like, you know, the network of values, right? Like a, a collective of people coming together, ideally with shared values, you know? And, um, you know, like there, there are quite a, a few things that have been raised. Like, you know, at the, when you opened earlier, Monica, you were talking about like how we need to think about not, not about those questions of equity and accessibility as like what comes later, but that it needs to be integrated in the DNA, right? Like in the very functioning, the very imagining, which all of you are doing, right? Like you are already thinking about those questions in a deep way in the very imagining of what that structure and those networks of relationship could look like. And one of the things that strikes me based on what you've shared, but also based on like my own context and, and people I've met over the years, um, you know, who actually have been doing that kind of imagining, sometimes within the institution, sometimes leaving the institution because it doesn't quite work out, and then doing their own thing. Um, and, and for me, that really brings up the question of leadership, which I think has been raised earlier today as well, in the sense of, you know, like, I, I feel it's a bit, I don't know if it's a chicken and egg question, but like, for me personally, like it's it's clear that there's a leadership, that there's knowledge, um, you know, knowledge that hasn't been valued, like some of you already pointed out to, right? Like that actually that forms of resistance and imagining, whether it's with regards to disability justice or transformative justice, that that has already existed. Um, and that there's knowledge out there, right? That might not be institutional or academic knowledge, but that exists in, in our practices in how we relate to each other and how we're building together. So my question then is how, uh, you know, like what do we make, how do we, you know, cause there's, there's a leadership there and there's knowledge and values that can come from people like all of you and other people doing the work on the ground. And then there's, you know, like what I like to call the dinosaur, which is like the, the structure of the institution. And clearly the leadership right now is coming from that structure, invested its own power and like whatever it is that that structure is trying to protect as a system. Um, and how do we get to that shift in leadership? 
uh, you know, because I, I feel and then that was a question that was raised earlier in terms of like, you know, like what is it that the institution has to learn from artists? Um, is that something that you want to share your thoughts about? I'm going to turn towards Monica. I don't know if you want to jump in here. I always want to share my thoughts, but I didn't want to dominate space. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. You're, you're kind of asking what is the tone and the tenor of leadership for the institutions we're hoping to spring forth? Is that, is that yes. accurate? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's definitely an element of servant leadership. So I have executive directed three museums in my lifetime and lived to tell the tale. <laughs> um, and every time I've been a leader in those spaces and beholden to boards and all the other, again, kind of pulling intentions, I always feel that I don't want to ask anyone to do anything that I'm not willing to do and that I want to model by example that I won't just delegate to them, but that I'll go, go with them and we'll work on things together. And I've strived to always um, you know, be available, be accessible, and never seem like I am too, um, you know, just better than, you know, so I mean, that's just on a kind of managerial level. But I also feel like the leadership has to be visionary and transformative. So if you are building, boosting, launching, running an institution, and you're not thinking about um, tomorrow and many more tomorrows, you know, and how to prepare for I hate to say, right, future pandemics, how to prepare for social upheaval, how to make sure your organization is responsive enough to pivot in the moment when it is needed and how your, your institution is, is going to be mindful, right, about its activities, you know, so when I, when I consult with institutions and, you know, I ask them, how do you spend your money, right, where do your contracts go, if you say, like many institutions last year came up with, like, Black Lives Matter solidarity statements, and that is good and fine, and that is a start, right, statement crafting is, is very, you know, laudable, and how do you put the action behind that, and what does that look like, and if you're really aligned with Black Lives or BIPOC Lives or any other marginalized or underserved group, right? How are you truly uplifting that group and trying to enhance with the power that you have the, the, the outcomes of that group and how to use your privilege to leverage on behalf of those who need, right? And so is it the case that you're giving opportunities or are you, again, I can't say enough to seed your seat, right? I've talked to certain boards and executive directors and they've said, oh, you know, what should we do, Monica? We, we, we want Black lives, all of this. And I'm like, great, which of you are ready to step down and nominate a BIPOC person to replace you? How are you doing succession planning? How do you replace yourself with the kinds of people that you say you want to attract, the, that you want to engage in the community, but literally let's let them lead it. Let's serve it to them on a platter. So I feel like there's a lot of different strategies and, and back to truth telling. There has to be certain people, whether those are artists or creative disruptors or consultants or people on the inside, people on the outside that are willing to speak truth in these spaces where often that is frowned upon. You know, you can have personal precarity as a result of speaking your mind and you out of a job or out of a situation or demoted and that is a real concern. But yet, if we are to um, really hold spaces accountable, someone or several someones have to speak and those on the side of leadership and privilege and power have to listen. So I think that is the dynamic um, that I'd like to see spring forth in, in leadership spaces. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. I, I have to admit there's a part of me that's like, but how do we make them listen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think there's a part of me that also feels that, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely- uh, It's a long you. game. <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight. It's a long game. It takes years and years and years to chip away at those. Uh, yeah, I guess that's why we're talking about longevity as well and, and, and the long game. But yeah, it is. I think there's something also in terms of thinking about like seeding power, right? Like and, and within those structures. Uh, other contributions to that previous question um, around leadership and like taking leadership from artist and where that comes from. Does anybody else want to share something with regards to that? I just, I just wanted to say that I loved how Monica explained that. I like that she really wanted to detail on it, but it really does begin with listening. It's interesting that to lead, you must listen throughout, not just like to start and then you do something, you act, but the action is a integration of listening in motion, I would argue. And so 
Uh, recently, for example, uh, two institutions in Germany reached out, the Hamburger Kunsthall and the, the Kunstmuseum in Bonn. And they said, you know, we really care about our workers and we care about the sustainability of our actions and we want to learn. And so then I said, how do you want to learn? And they said, well, we want to learn by also engaging with the broader reality of our culture and of our community and of our political system. And, and they, they cited the Paris Accord, the Paris Climate Accord, where there's a 50% reduction aim in carbon emissions by all of us by 2030. So they said, we want to focus on that. We want to focus on our reductions. And so we started doing the math. And in listening to the different groups, I noticed that um, it was really the youth actors in the institutions that were bubbling with excitement. They were quite keen on the work they were doing. And it's, you know, it's arduous work. I mean, you're just filling out spreadsheets and looking at metrics and figuring out how do we ship something in a more sustainable way and, and learning these step-by-step -step actions. And so in that process, I saw that if you make space for, for someone, for people's voice in a way they can fill it and they can guide themselves. And so I did very little in, in particular with those two institutions um, and they self-guided their own improvements in their practices. And I think it was both very accounting, uh, very uh, empowering for them to engage in their own accountability for their climate space and for their consideration of environmental justice. Um, but also it was interesting to see how when an institution um, engages nonprofits, engages artist support, and engages sort of more of a decentered or decentralized approach to identity, it actually makes the identity of the institution itself all the, I would say, all the more um, grounded and all the more centered on its core. And so I think that inclusivity and that openness um, allows leadership to actually be stronger and not just be about one, one person or one voice. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Haley, for, for uh, bringing that up. Um, yeah, I very much like that too. Um, Carmen or Callum, do you want to, is there something you want to share at this point? I could talk a bit about some experiments that Black Swan has done in trying to separate out decision-making around resource distribution within cultural institutions and um, like the economic contribution of those resources. So like the speculative model of Black Swan is based on this idea of the silent stakeholder, which are the cultural institutions, um, the funders, maybe even galleries that are able to provide resources or have resources. Um, and they, in our model, pledge them to be totally governed by artists or creative practitioners. And so <clears throat> this like multi-voting tool that we developed is intended to be used for deciding how existing resources within the art world are used. And this um, experiment that we ran at Cave over the summer uh, involved 40, 40 practitioners um, that for a month um, in September had to negotiate what to do with basically 20, um, some were residency spaces, some were micro grants, um, different art resources. And it was quite interesting because as we Black Swan went into this process, we had this like speculative model of wanting to separate out governance and like resource use or the decisions around resource distribution but we weren't sure how easy it would be to convince like institutions to take part in this because it it requires such a, a leap of faith i guess and risk and um everything that the neoliberal institution is trying so hard to like pretend doesn't exist and so we were super surprised that we ended up with 10 or so like everybody we asked said yes to our experiment um which i think also shows maybe some understanding from within corners of institutions also that things need to change and that um we need to try different things but yeah it was it was super interesting to test this separation of um economic contribution and decision making and i think that's like maybe a more parasitic 
approach to um, addressing some of the issues we've been talking about and like Monica discussing seating the seat of a board is like a, a maybe more um, internal approach. And then I guess the experiments we've done are more external or exogenous. Thank you, Callum. Hi. Can I quickly go? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just gonna follow that up by talking a little bit about the, the, the second principle of disability justice is leadership by those most impacted. And um, uh, you know, this, these principles come from the collective Sins Invalid and uh, specifically uh, members, uh, you know, Patty Byrne uh, and, uh, so anyways, uh, the, the idea of, you know, uh, leadership by those most impacted within the disability community um, and with any movement, I think, is that, you know, if you are being led by the people who most know the systems that are failing them, um, then you, you are, are becoming aware of all the failures of the system that you're, you're working with it. So I think, I think the people who, uh, you know, know um, uh, what it feels like to not have access, not have representation, not see their culture reflected back to them, um, are who need to be leading. Um, and and if, if we're talking about uh, the disability community or the broader disability community, the, this is a group that that just historically has not had agency and decision making power within their own you know uh, lives in some ways uh, because of their access to public life. Um, and to participate fully in public life, but also within their own healthcare. Um, so, you know, I, I think sometimes, um, yeah, like I, I, we, in order to uh, accommodate for the diverse needs within the community, um, we do have to, you know, be led by folks who are poor and uh, racialized and um, who have the least access within, um, you know, our, you know, our health system within our cultural sector um, um, and, and what have you. Um, and, and I think that's, that's how we can honor, um, you know, humanity, I think, in its wholeness and, um, and where the cultural institution actually becomes a site for, you know, it's not just a, cult, a cultural history or a, a, a document or archive or a keeper of cultural history uh, written by a specific uh, uh, few, um, you know, who, who maybe uh, uh, kind of have that privilege to that platform um, historically or traditionally, um, but it's, it, it is bringing, you know, the, those new, um, I, I'd like to think, so in 2015, I, I wrote this accessibility manifesto called Open Access, and I talk about accessibility being um, something that can support a continu continuum of embodiments, identities, realities, and learning styles. And, and I, I do think that that's what we need the, uh, the, the museum to be um, as well, is, is uh, something that can su support all of those um, <clears throat> Uh, perspectives, um, and and that's only going to happen if they are, you know, these these institutions are led by by folks who hold those experiences. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. Um, I have one more question, actually. Um, you know, when we uh, around all of this, uh, there's, there's just I have like three pages of notes in front of me. <laughs> like this is just so generative and so rich. Thank you, everyone. Um, one of the questions that I have is around like the notions of values, really, because like I think one of the things that we've kind of like broken down for this conversation is the you know like the understanding that yes, there's a system, there's a structure, but also it's the people, right? Like down the line who actually run this, and then it's about like shifting. Uh, in terms of the people and their values on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there's, you know, people like you, people like us who are doing speculative fiction, you know, are thinking differently, which of course, and all of this is grounded in values, right? Like in, in your own values, right? Like uh, personally, and then, uh, you know, and then there's, and then you meet other people who share those those values, right? Like, and and you come together, and then you you start making your thing, you start your collective, right? Like, or you start pushing against the institution. And I think one of the things that's coming out for me it is that question of value, and like you know, and 
it's not, in my experience, at the very least, you know, there, there, there are people like you who do the work that you do, where you talk about your values as you have today. You know, there, there are certain artists who might do it, but like we do not necessarily, in my experience, have that like, you know, like it's we, that sort of like stating of the value that you're working from and the work that you want to be doing, even as artists. And if we're thinking of, um, you know, like chipping away, as, as Monica said, like chipping away at that, that uh, you know, at the institution and that structure in that way, do you think that also individually, and, and then of course then collectively, that it is actually important for us, in particular, when we're thinking of that shift of, uh, of leadership, it would, for us as people with lived experiences who are marginalized and or for artists, is it important for us to, first of all, do that interrogation in terms of our own values, like me as an artist, what do I stand for? What do I want to be, one? And then two, to actually explicitly express that. Uh, do you feel that's a, a, a necessity? Absolutely, Kama. I think that, um, I mean, that's what we're doing here today. And that's why I really appreciate that the Fee Foundation of Contemporary Art gathered this very lucid uh, group of individuals. And I look forward to the rest of the series because it's reflection that is most important for action. And I don't think there's, in listening to the different speakers today, there's, there's not one topic. I think that is more important than the others. They're all important, but I think that the thread that I can see weaving a tapestry that is um, functional is this one of, of awareness and, and, and widening awareness and widening acceptance. Um, I think it's awareness and acceptance go hand in hand. It's about um, reducing these barriers of judgment, reducing these barriers of like con con the conflict we face with um, unfolding newness and unfolding um, the education of our own brains as we, we, we move away from like past trainings that were maybe not effective or not um, promotional for life and moving toward something that is healthy, that is accessible to all, and that allows our arts to develop in a way that reflect um, who we truly are and how we truly um, envision a, a successful uh, future together. What about you, Carmen? What do you think? Um, can you... Sorry, Kama, could you uh, restate the question? I, I need to find a way, I, I, a way in again, sorry. Uh, yes, I was um, framing the question around values, whether it's important on the one hand for us as individual and artists to like do that work of reflection, but also to explicitly like name the values that we're working from and, and the vision towards which we, we want to build so that individually, if we do that, we find each other collectively. I, I think we do, yeah, definitely. And and I, I definitely see this like within this panel too, like these connecting threads and um and how you know what what I'm calling for in disability justice is 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 exactly what um you know fo folks um on this panel are are calling for as well as like a you know a re a restructuring of power and um um I I think yeah, like how are we going to find our people if we don't say, you know, you know, tell people who we are? Um, and I think there's this really exciting moment within disability activism this year uh, around the opposition to Bill C7, which is the Medical Assistance and Dying Act. And um, it was, they held, uh, there's this event called the Disability Filibuster that held um, you know, 24 hour live streams for a few days leading up to the passing, eventual passing of this bill that uh, broadened the guidelines uh, so uh, for medical assistance and dying. So anybody with a disability diagnosis um, could um, either a request or um, be recommended um, medical assistance and dying to um, alleviate their condition of disability. Um, so I, I think in that moment though, um, because there was such this presence, like we, we're so like separated by distance um, 
and, and uh, limited mobility and barriers to mobility uh, within the disability community. This virtual live stream, it was full of people talking about what their values were and like, like representing their politics and like talking about what it means to like live and, and hold disability culture. And um, um, because there was such some of the audio, sorry. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think it was a moment where a lot of people found each other and like there's already collaboration going on for like, you know, artistic interventions um, from people who found, uh, the, the, you know, each other within this within this moment um, uh, in, in the spring. And, um, you know, there are people who are doing harm reduction work in Vancouver downtown east side who are now uh, understanding their uh, their their place and connection within the broader disability movement, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I just, yeah, I think we need to take up our platforms, what we have access to, and and definitely, you know, talk, yeah, share share our politics, share our values, and yeah, hopefully we find each other. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, add a little to this, and I love what um, the fellow panelists have said. I think it's essential, right, that individuals and institutions, right, those collectives of people are crystal clear on their values and, yes, and I think it's important that we approach hearing each other out with a spirit of consideration and openness and sometimes compromise so that we can realize we may evolve in our values. We may learn something, learn several things that help us pivot and shift and, and consider differently. And so values are pretty set in stone, but also keeping that spirit of openness um, to understanding and considering other points of view and, and tolerance, if that was the right word, I think that is also important. So it's good to know where you're starting from, right? And certainly say, as an artist, as an individual, as a human, here's how I show up and what I show up for, what's happening in the world, here's how I feel about it, what's happening in my community, here's how I feel about it, and here's the kind of perspectives and worldview I brought to the table and realizing we don't have to be so hard-nosed that we can't evolve and grow and learn over time. Um, I also think just in the spirit of remedy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly consumed, you know, whether that's an institution or, or a situation of like, you know, what's wrong, what's right, and how do we fix it? And so having a value like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any one thing that I am like, forever pro or forever against, but it's like, how do we get to being that solutionary in that space of realizing how our presence and our perspective and our worldviews can show up um, and resolve what needs to be resolved? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Monica. Yes, indeed, like that notion of like shifting and changing and growing and resolving and repairing uh, also fundamentally, like, yeah, it's, yes, you can have a value, but then, and you can communicate that value, but then, you know, like where, how does that shift and, and how does transformation happen for that? We have one minute left. I don't know if Callum, if you want to add anything at this point or not, it's totally okay. I, I think just following on from what Monica was saying about these like values in flux, um, having looked a bit at value as part of our research in Black Swan, um, they can become like regulatory ideals. Um, and I think like looping back to something that Kama asked me earlier, earlier in this panel, um, I think it becomes about how values are enacted. Um, how do we create practices that make our values tangible and lived and embodied so that they're not just um, discursive ideals, but also like living practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, Carmen, Haley, Callum, for this such uh, a rich and generative conversation. Uh, speaking for myself, I, I'm still like buzzing uh, in my body, in my spirit, in my mind. And I think there's just like so much from, from, from your generosity. Thank you for sharing about your experiences, about your dreams, about like, you know, the future you're dreaming of. Uh, just for me on a very personal level, this is just so generative. And th those are just 
there's just so much in what we've discussed in this little time that I can actually bring back to my own context and bring back to my own communities uh, and in the work that we're doing collectively. So thank you very much for this. Thank you everybody uh, for joining us and we'll see you for the next session in a moment. I have no sense of time right now, but thank you everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kava. My goodness, you're the host, really, with the most. And, and thank you so much to the panelists, Callum, Haley, Monica, Carmen. Um, you've given us a lot to chew on. It's been so generous, truly careful, and, and in-depth. Um, and so we'll close this panel, but we'll keep these discussions going. Um, thank you also to all of us in uh, in the forum for bringing our presence to this deep dive panel um, we'll now take a short break and we'll invite you to reconvene with us at 2 15 for our second deep dive session two reframing the spaces of the cultural institution thank you all again and see you at 2 15.